reviewing a sick patient. I think reviewing a sick patient is something that can cause a lot of um, anxiety, especially amongst new doctors. A first piece of advice, if a nurse says they're worried, um, take that concern seriously um, and review that patient. So first safety approach. So this has been taught very frequently in life support courses, always before approaching patients. And sometimes it's neglected because it's assumed that particularly in inpatient settings, that it is indeed safe. Now with the COVID pandemic, this advice has never been so important and relevant. Never rush your thought process, nor your actions when called to sick patient. Under the stress and de-stress of seeing sick and potentially deteriorating patients that you as an F1 may be called for for the first time, it's really important just to take a breath and be systematic in approach. That is the ABCD approach which should never change. With any sick patient, be systematic. One of the best piece of advice I had in medical school that has always stuck with me is ABC, save your GMC. So just do that, um, work through that. It's gonna be really quick if the patient's actually quite well and if the patient is sick and needs escalation, then that systematic approach is gonna help you out and guide you through those steps. So A, looking at the airway, is it patent? Is there a foreign body? Is there any mucus, any blood, any secretions that can be suctioned or using calipers if, it's, uh, if it can be removed in order to um, remove the obstruction to the airway in order to allow air entry in? Secondly, looking at breathing. So with breathing, we're going to be looking at the effort, the efficacy and the effect of breathing. The respiratory effort will be very simply measured by the respiratory rate to see if they're tachypneic. The Efficacy of breathing will be based on the saturations, the readings that you will see, and the effect of breathing will also be seen by how pink they look and if they're cyanosed at all. The next thing that we're going to be looking at is the circulation, where we look at the blood pressure and the pulse, and we can do a very quick fluid status review where we can look at the eye, eyes, look at skin tagger, and um, look at mucous membranes to see if a patient is particularly dehydrated. Next thing is looking at disability, so any signs of abnormal posturing, uh, any abnormalities in the pupils, uh, and if they are hypoglycemic, uh, this is the point where we'd be looking at the capillary blood glucose. And finally, on exposure, we're looking for rashes, injuries, burns, trauma, anything else. When you're exposing part of the patient bit by bit to see if there's anything that you've noticed, then you may pick up things like um, PR bleed or uh, rashes for anaphylaxis. Uh, or any acute sweat, any swelling or any injuries. Fix any problem that you see and to reassess constantly thereafter. So for example, if you see that a patient has got a low oxygen saturation and when you're assessing breathing, immediately put them uh, on oxygen. Usually it's a uh, good practice to put patients on 15 litres via a non-rebreather unless they are a chronic retainer if they've got COPD. But just be aware of that, otherwise putting them on high flow oxygen initially to increase their uh, oxygen delivery and their oxygen saturations, and then can go back and reassess. So start from airway again, breathing refixed, move on to circulation, disability exposure, and so forth. If the problem may be noted in the circulation element of it when they've got low blood pressure and you want to get established IV access, which you should do so with a wide bore cannula, so a gray or an orange cannula, uh, then you cannulate the patient, but give them a fluid bolus, for example, 250 or 500 mils of crystalloid solution, and then reassess again. Airway, breathing, circulatory assessment again, then disability and exposure. And you should constantly reassess until you have fixed or addressed all aspects of the A, B, C, D, E, at which point you have sufficient information for you to hand over to a senior. It's also important to gain as much succinct, relevant information as possible. So trends and patterns is important, particularly in relation to observations. To give you an example, a fit young patient on the ward may have a slightly low normal blood pressure, but it hasn't changed since admission, has a good urine output, has a full GCS, both of which are indicators of pressure dependent end organ diffusion. So that may be sufficient for that person compared to that of a diabetic and a hypertensive 70 year old that may be struggling with the blood pressure of a similar number. In essence, what I'm trying to point out is if you're looking at numbers, please observe the trend for that specific patient with that specific comorbidities.
what is their current status, what are their observations now, um, and what were their last set of observations. So for comparison, is there a trend? Are they rapidly deteriorating? Have they actually always had a low blood pressure for the last 24 hours? And we're not worried about that. So just trying to take those things into account. Some nurses will be able to give you a really lovely history, tell you exactly what's going on with the patient, um, what their observations are and why they're worried. And you'll know straight away, they'll kind of guide you what to do. Others, you'll get a bit more of a vague handover. In those cases where it's more vague, the first thing I would do is go and eyeball the patient. If they're up reading a book and actually look okay, you've then got time to go and read the notes, find out what's been going on, and then go and review them. If that patient from the end of the bed looks sick, start your review straight away, and you can gather that information afterwards. It's also important to have a look at their medical history, see what they came in with, what treatments they already had, if they were a post-operative patient, to be aware of post-operative SERS or post-operative sepsis. A patient who's dehydrated, who you're considering has gone into AKI, may need certain nephrotoxic drugs uh, to be suspended on their growth chart. In a patient who had, you are querying internal bleeding or major hemorrhage, if there are any blood thinners, then it's also important to be very aware of that and if you can stop them, to be able to stop them. And if it's possible to reverse them, so for example, for patients who are on warfarin, who have AF have metallic valves uh, and have a higher INR uh, threshold, um, it may be possible to reverse warfarin by giving them intravenous vitamin K, oral vitamin K, or uh, berry flex or pro uh, pro complex concentrate. Think about which investigations will be the most useful in a sick patient as well as giving you the most immediate or quick result. Just really think about what you yourself can do in the immediacy with the skills and knowledge that you've developed now as a clinician before calling for help. You as an F1 can do lots of things. You can prescribe medications, you can prescribe fluids, analgesics, oxygen. You can maneuver patients into appropriate resuscitation positions. You can perform technical skills in the form of cannulation, catheterization, ABGs. You can perform CPR as per ILS or ALS standards. You're not alone in all this. You're not expected to manage everything alone. That's why you escalate. When it comes to escalation and asking for help, the SBAR is really a great structure to use and to avoid any information being missed out. Within your home team on call, you'll probably have your F2, your core training and your reg there. And I personally found it much easier to ask for help if you put yourself forward at the start of the shift and personally introduce yourself to the rest of the members of the team. So what happens if you can't call them? Well, you have the med team, the medical emergency team, or the critical care outreach team. Uh, these consist of very experienced resource officers and senior IC nurses who have seen and managed a lot of these cases for years in the wards. Their advice is invaluable. So please ask for help, as well as learning from them as much as you can when you start. And if you can't get help quick enough and you think that the patient is really sick and about to deteriorate rapidly, no one will criticise you for calling the cardiac arrest team. Always better to be safe than sorry. Get help if at any point you're worried about any of those things. Um, escalate it. If the patient is rapidly deteriorating, if you are worried, if their blood pressure is dropping, if they're desatting, don't be afraid to put out the 2222 um, if it's peri-arrest and get helping hands there. That's the quickest way to get lots of people there to help you. If you've got time, if the patient is stable but is sick and you're not sure how to manage it, um, escalate it to the SHO or the registrar on call to get another review. Just find out um, a bit about their history, why they were in hospital, what's gone on so far. Um, look at what their escalation plan is. Have they got a TEPS form or DNAR? Those kind of things. It's just really good to be aware of what their um, treatment ceiling of care is. One thing um, that I think is very helpful with all sick patients is um, to try and get a blood gas if they're poorly because that can really um, guide you and it can either be something that's really reassuring if they've got a normal blood gas, it can reassure you about some things or it can kind of increase your speed of escalating even if they've got a sky high lactate or CO2. Um, so it's just a really useful um, test to get on early on. Always be aware of whom you can escalate your concerns to acutely unwell patients because that is the most simplest and foolproof way of managing any acutely unwell patient. For example, if a patient has been recently stepped down from ICU, you can contact ICU immediately and they will be well aware of the patient and they'll be very in a very good position normally 
to come down, review the patient and advise on the best possible management for them. So one nugget of advice would be to maximize the use of technology, such as your phone, appropriately. So for instance, you can have the local policies of medical emergency management at hand, such as hyperkalemia or acute asthmatic on your phone, so that's accessible and quick to refer to. The Oxford Handbook for the Foundation Program is a really good starting point because it gives you one page summaries of medical emergencies uh, if you can get it on your phone. You can also use the ALS app, which is great for referring to dosages and management of acute conditions as well as MD Calc for dosages, and also particularly the BMF. Think about maximising the help and use of available colleagues in the ward. So nursing staff are able to give salient information about your patient because they've nursed them for the past several consecutive shifts, as well as being competent to perform certain procedures, as well as source your equipment that you may need for other procedures. So just as the application of knowledge is important, so too are the non-technical skills of closed-loop communication real team working, task delegation, and debrief. No one is, nor can be perfect, but you should always try and learn from the previous encounter or event. Whenever you're fixing any element of ABCDE, go back to A and finish the A to E assessment, constantly reassess, be aware of what treatments you've given to the patient, what treatments they've already had, and what treatments you may anticipate giving them so that you can give this information succinctly in a handover. Be aware of which teams you can contact. Don't be worried about sick patients. If they're systematic, escalate as needed, treat as you find things, get an idea of what's going on with that patient, and you will be fine. So don't worry and just be calm. Thank you very much for listening and all the best in the next coming months and please stay safe. Thank you very much and all the very best.